You have questions about magic in Starfinder? I have answers. They may not be the answers you want, but I got them. Is there magic in Starfinder? Yes. How do spells work? It's not that complicated. How is spell DC calculated when it comes to Starfinder? Easily. Do you need a free hand to be able to cast magic within Starfinder? <laughs> How many spells do I get? It depends. Detailed answers to all of these questions coming up. Hello and welcome to the table. My name's Nathaniel. This is a channel where I discuss lore and world building around some of your favorite role playing games and mine. If that's something you're interested in, I would love to have you join me at the table. How did I come up with all of these questions? Well, I just did a bit of Google searching and found some common themes, some common questions that keep getting asked around magic when it comes to Starfinder. One of the first things we have to cover with magic is how it functions and how it looks aesthetically to the world. You may have been wondering what does casting a spell look like? Is it all glowy? Is it rather mundane? Can you do it stealthily or quietly? When we look at the core rulebook on page 330, here's what it says about magic. When your character casts a spell, they are harnessing the latent magical energy that permeates the universe to achieve specific measured effects. Whether you are playing a mystic or a technomancer or a character who has gained the ability to manipulate magical energies through some or more unusual means, casting a spell in Starfinder follows one basic process as described below. A cast spell always has some visual cue to creatures around you that a spell is being cast. It is also not possible to clandestinely cast a spell. In other words, you cannot do it quietly or stealthily. Whether you love this or whether you hate this, that's the way it's written. Personally, I'm a little disappointed that spells cannot be done in a stealthy manner. But I do understand why it has to be done this way or approached this way. When you're dealing with a high technology, high magic setting, you need something to obviously separate the magic from the technology. And when you're dealing in threats, you have to be able to identify priority targets, like casters who can deal large amounts of damage. Now keep in mind that this works for you as the players, and it also works for the GM playing as the enemies. Anyone who casts a spell has some glowing effect around them, and they now can become a priority one target. This also means that for casting your spells, there doesn't have to be a verbal component, a hearing component, or even a material cost. If I wish to cast a spell, I will just do so. No, I do not need any bar missions from the bourgeoisie. Haha. <laughs> Rituals may still require some components just due to the fact that they are rituals and that just makes sense to me, but we can cover them in another video. Now, one of the other big questions that I've run into is do you need to have free hands or at least one free hand to be able to cast a magical spell? What does the core rulebook say about this? If we look on page 331, it says to be able to cast a spell, you must concentrate. The length of time you must concentrate to cast a spell is specified in the casting time entry of the spell's description, blah blah blah. Your foes can interrupt your spell casting in a few ways. If you are attacked, this will interrupt your spell. If you are trying to cast a spell that cannot be done in its environment and just cannot function, then of course the spell will fail. Like trying to cast a fireball underwater. It does not say anything about needing your limbs or being able to speak or being able to hear to cast a spell. It simply says you must be able to concentrate. I guess the only other exception to this would be some spells require line of sight. So as long as you possess the ability to concentrate on your spell, you can cast a spell. Now, as we've learned, casting a spell does have some kind of glowy component to it. You are visually noticeable. If your spell requires you to focus or to concentrate for longer than one round, you are definitely going to become a priority target. So plan accordingly. Before we move on to how spells work, do you agree with what I've just said? Do you run your games the same way or can you cast a spell silently and stealthily in your games? If you do operate it this way at your tables, please tell me why in the comments below. Now, as for how spells work, 
it's not really that complicated. For mystics, most of the time it just happens. Your target will still need to do some kind of a saving throw to either negate the effects or take half damage if it's a damage dealing spell. The Technomancer tends to have quite a few attack roll based spells. The key thing to note here is if your spell requires you to make an attack roll and you miss, you still expend the spell slot. And we'll talk about spell slots in a minute. Now there are a few level zero spells or cantrips that have got some adjustments when it came to galactic magic. Energy Ray, Hazard, Injury, Echo, as well as Telekinetic Projectile. These are all examples of level zero spells, but in galactic magic, they got a new scaling option that still makes them viable at higher levels. Unfortunately, with some spells, as you advance in levels, they just become useless. If you follow some of these variant rules, these spells at certain levels will deal more damage. You can apply this to other cantrip level spells, but always talk to your GM first before you start just making decisions like this on your own. Now, some of these changes I think are good. Starting at level three, adding half your caster level to the damage as a baseline is great. At level seven, you start increasing dice damage. For example, any spell that deals 1d3 damage now goes to a 2d4. Other spells that are a little bit stronger, like a 1d6 damage, now have 2d6 damage. And then again, at 10th, 13th, and 15th level, you just add another die's worth of damage. If it's a d4, you just add another one of those. If it's a d6, add another one of those. It's 17th and 19th level where these spells really get some big adjustments. You will add two more of the damage dice at each of these levels. So an energy ray at 19th level would deal 9d4 damage plus nine. Is this going to compete with level 19 weapons? No, no, it's not. Is it going to give you options at higher levels for level zero spells? Absolutely. Another common question that I run into is how are spell DCs calculated? There is a little bit of a formula. I promise it's not that bad. There are two kinds of checks that you might be required to make as a caster. One is a caster level check. This is very simple. Roll a d20, add your caster level. Done. This kind of a check is usually made to overcome a creature's spell resistance. There are also feats that you can grab to increase your caster level so that you can more easily overcome spell resistance. The other more common check is going to be spell DC. And this is something that you have to know as the caster because your GM will ask you for it when they are rolling defense. Essentially, how difficult is it for creatures to resist your magical charms? Oh, won't you just be a deer for me and go rob that bank for me? I am Frosh. Your abilities of the love making, they are nothing compared to mine. In order to find out what your spell DC is, you will start off with 10. You will add the spell level of which you are casting. Then you will add your key ability score. If you are a mystic, this will be wisdom. If you are a technomancer, this will be intelligence. And from there, you will add any other modifiers that you have. This is how you calculate your spell DC. Now, if you are multi-classing into any kind of spell caster, just know that in order to cast a level of spell, your key ability score for the caster class must be 10 plus the level you want. So if you want to cast a level one spell, you must have a minimum of 11 in your wisdom, intelligence, whatever it is. If you're maining into a spellcaster class, you don't really have to worry about this. Now, how many spells do you get? Because there are over 200 spells for each of the caster classes. We will have to do a little bit of cross-checking when it comes to the manual and for your class. Find out what your key ability score is for your caster class, and then you'll have to look at this chart. The first one will tell you how many spells you know, and depending on what your key ability score is, how many extra you know. The next one will tell you how many spells you can cast per day. Very simple. Whatever level you are, follow it across. That's how many spells you can cast. This number can't really be increased, but your key ability score will determine how many spells you know. Thankfully, there are no preparation rules, so as long as you know a spell, you can cast the spell. There are also some variant magic rules thanks to galactic magic, and I can do that in another video if anyone is interested in that. Let me know about that in the comments below. 
Now, if you're preparing for your first Starfinder game, or maybe even your 10th Starfinder game, I have a video for you on the screen now, which is going to help you be better prepared. Thank you to all of my patrons who continue to support me and the channel. All of your support is greatly appreciated. My name's Nathaniel. Thanks for stopping by, everyone.